You're listening to the Hog Sports Network Daily Podcast. Now, here's your host, Matt Jones. And happy Thursday to you. We appreciate you being here with us. Lots to talk about today. We're going to really take an in-depth look at Oklahoma State. We'll talk to Taylor McCarg. He called the Oklahoma State game last Saturday against South Dakota State on ESPN Plus a little bit later in the show. We'll talk to Marshall Scott from the Pistols Firing blog. Uh, he covers Oklahoma State quite extensively. Christina Long will also be in studio uh, today as we take a head-to-head comparison look at the Razorbacks and the Cowboys. But first, we've got Taylor McCarg with us. Taylor uh, played quarterback at Rice University, and as I mentioned, he was on the call the other day for the Cowboys' 44-20 to victory over South Dakota State at Boone Pickens Stadium. Taylor, good morning. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Hey, morning, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hey, so Mike Gundy, after the game, said that Oklahoma State failed to live up to his lofty expectations. He said he has high expectations for his team every game. You know, but they beat a good team pretty soundly. You were there. What, how did you come away from the game feeling about the Cowboys? Yeah, I thought it was an interesting comment from Coach because we were off air in the fourth quarter in a TV timeout actually talking kind of amongst ourselves about how clean the performance was for Oklahoma State. I think it ended up as one penalty total on both sides of the ball no turnovers, uh, no special teams issues. And uh, there was never really an opportunity for South Dakota State to get back in that game. Mm-hmm. Built up Oklahoma State built up a little bit of a lead in the, in the first half. And every time it felt like there was an opportunity to get this back to a one-score game or get any momentum on the side of South Dakota State, it, it really got squashed. And you saw uh, Ollie Gordon had – uh, the numbers by the end of the game, I think he put together a good performance, but it took several touches. I mean, he got, I think, when you go look at his his carries and receptions, I think it was close to 30 touches mm-hmm. altogether. Um, but there wasn't a lot of the big chunk plays with Ollie Gordon or, or a couple here and there. I think that was some of what uh, Gundy was frustrated with. On the defensive side, I thought they played pretty sound. Uh, the linebacking core that um, – everybody's obviously made a lot of, they showed up. I thought they played really well. The only aspect of uh, really both sides of the ball from Oklahoma state that I thought, you know, was a little pedestrian was the defensive line. I I did not think they did a great job of getting after Mark Gronowski. But if you look at sort of the off season headlines and what they were a little worried about that front seven, uh, really the defensive line, uh, that was one of the bigger concerns, and and I think that's if I'm an Arkansas fan looking at this and where the opportunity is, I think it's uh, I don't know how they're gonna what pressure is gonna look like from Oklahoma State, mm-hmm. uh, but overall I thought it was a really good performance in Week One against a really good South Dakota State team. If you look at the stats from that game last Saturday between Oklahoma State and South Dakota State, you know I think Oklahoma State only outgained them by about six yards. South Dakota State actually averaged more yards per play. So what was the difference? Uh, on the scoreboard versus what maybe what the stats would tell us about the game. Yeah, it was the procedure was just clean from Oklahoma State. They stayed on schedule and they also had some really key fourth down and third down conversions. Uh, There was a wheel route to Ollie Gordon, I believe, in the third quarter where they're at about midfield. Excuse me, it's actually a fourth down conversion. They hit a wheel route to Ollie Gordon. The ball's underthrown by Bowman. And that was one of the opportunities that we talked about after the game that if South Dakota State had gotten the ball at midfield, they drive down and score, now it's a field goal game. Um, those things, every single one of those breaks went Oklahoma State's way. And it looked like a team, and what I would expect this week as well, especially given that uh, this is at home, this is a team that has so much returning production. There, there are guys all over the field that are 22, 23, 24 years old, um, and they play like it, at least in week one they did. And that kind of veteran experience in week one, it, it was just a, a clean brand of football. And I think that's why uh, they never really allowed South Dakota State to, uh, once they built up that early lead, get back in the game. You mentioned the age, and we spoke about this with Phil Steele about Oklahoma State uh, about two or three weeks ago. It's not just the fact that they're old, but a lot of these players have been in that system for a long time. It, it's not a matter of, of where you've got a lot of grad transfers coming into this program. They're older, but they've also been together for a while. I wonder how much you think that helps their program. Uh, there's no doubt. And I, it really showed on the offensive line as well. Uh, Mahalski, their center, I think he may be the best center in college football. Um, if he's not, he's, he's certainly in the top three or four. 
Um, the offensive line play was really sound. I don't think Bowman got touched in the first half. I don't think there was a single time. I got to go back and look, but I don't think he got touched at all. And there were no protection breaks. Uh, South Dakota State tried to dial up a few pressures, and they, they didn't really get home. And you're exactly right. You, you could have guys that are older, and you can have seniors and fifth-year seniors, but if they haven't played, then that may not mean much. Mm. But you go down the offensive line especially, it felt like every one of those guys had 30 starts, 40 starts. The left tackle, uh, Dalton Cooper, transferred in from Texas State. I think he had 30, 30 or 40 starts at Texas State before he got to Oklahoma State. So um, there's experience all over the field. And then I thought they did a really good job. Presley – they made sure they got him involved early. I think he had five touches just in the first quarter alone. Uh, and then 10, Rashad Owens as well. The 50-50 balls, deep shots. If you go back to the bowl game uh, last year at the Texas Bowl, it felt like they hadn't missed a beat on trying to. If they get in the red zone or there's any opportunity to go over the top, a lot of times they were targeting Rashad Owens. How good is Ollie Gordon? He is uh, – uh, he's if he's not the best back in college football, he's he's at the top one or top two or three. Um, he is. If you remember the days of like Vince Young, it doesn't look like he's running that fast, but he's running really fast. Mm -hmm. That was my impression of Ollie Gordon, where when he really got going, he, his stride is so long. He's on the say he's six two. He looks six three uh, when you get next to him on the field. And the other thing that was really impressive, and it's the reason that they have him out of the pistol and not in flat back. Mm -hmm. He gets going downhill, and right at the point of attack, he does such a nice job of breaking down, and he makes people miss right at the point of attack, and it's all in the tackle box. And for a back that's that big, uh, a lot of times you would think that they would just lower the shoulder, try to bowl somebody over. He's making people miss, and you saw it a number of times where either a corner or a secondary position is coming downhill, and they go at his ankles, makes a miss, breaks all sorts of tackles. I forget, PFF put it out, but – I think he came in as at number one in the country in terms of missed tackles uh, forced in week one. And for Arkansas and any team that plays Ollie Gordon, tackling well, I know that sounds really elementary and, and basic, but it's going to be the focus every single week. The, the first guy doesn't get there. You need to have three or four guys rallying to the football and make sure that you're gang tackling him because he, he's a really physical runner. You know, you, you're right. It does sound elementary, but it really does come down to blocking, tackling, not missing assignments. I mean, the teams that can do that best are the teams that, that typically are going to win the games. Yeah, it, you're exactly right. And it's the coaching points that uh, when, you know, these coaches get on either interviews or post-game press conferences or they're speaking to the fans, those are the things that I think fans think of as, oh, it's just coach speak. Uh, but it's in this game, especially with the the experience that we just talked about across the board and a guy like Ollie Gordon if there are, if you have breaks in your fundamentals, if you're not gap sound, if you don't have gap integrity, you don't tackle well, you have penalties, Oklahoma State's going to beat you because, it, again, just with the volume of production they have coming back, they're not going to make that many mistakes. Uh, if, if if there was a weakness in this team from a year ago that I we didn't get to see any of it in, in week one, it was uh, Bowman turning the football over because a year ago, especially later in the year when they got in trouble – he had several turnovers. Most of his mm -hmm. interceptions came late in the year and there really wasn't an opportunity for South Dakota state. I think there was one throw that should have been picked off and it was late in the game when it really wasn't close. Uh, but for Arkansas, if they can get them off schedule and force Oklahoma state um, to uh, an Allen Bowman to have to throw the football, I think that's a key to, to winning this game. I want to go more in depth on Bowman because the feeling that I get is that Arkansas is going to pack the box and try to, you know, put an emphasis on stopping Gordon and make Bowman beat them with his arm. Uh, can he do it? I mean, is he the type of quarterback that that can beat a team not having? If a team is able to take away their strength in Ollie Gordon, can Bowman beat them? Yeah, it remains to be seen. I, I don't have a great answer for it because last year, um, and, and we saw it a little bit in Week One as well. Most of his completions, a lot of it is in screen game. A lot of it, like Presley especially, early in the game, they're trying to get him the ball on the perimeter. Um, they're trying to make sure that it's easy, quick completions out to the flat, screen game, um, and then design shot plays over the top where there's really only one or two reads. Um, if you can get after him, get him off platform, one of the things he struggled with a year ago was 
throwing off his back foot when he had pressure in his lap. And we just didn't see that in week one because South Dakota State wasn't getting anywhere close to him. Mm -hmm. Um, Can he – is this a quarterback that's going to put the team on his back? Probably not. I don't think he's that type of talent, and I don't think in this system they're asking him to do that. But there's no secret, and Coach Gundy's talked about it very openly, they want to get Ollie Gordon 20 to 25 touches a game. 20 is basically the minimum. Um, But if they can get him 20, 25, up to 30 touches a game – that's the recipe. Uh, and then beyond that, trying to make sure that they keep Bowman on schedule. I think that's the key for them on offense all season. Talking with Taylor McCarg from uh, ESPN called the Oklahoma State South Dakota State game last weekend. So, not every FCS team is made equally. I think sometimes people kind of have a misconception of that. But we saw last week when Arkansas played UAPB. I'm not so sure that Fayetteville High School couldn't have given the Razorbacks a, a, a better game than, <laughs> than what Pine Bluff did. Uh, but South Dakota State's a good program. They've won a couple of consecutive FCS national championships. We saw in Arkansas UAPB that the skill level between those two teams was vast. What, was it, what, what did you see the difference was between Oklahoma State and South Dakota State? The thing that jumped out about South Dakota State, and even though, again, it was a – it was never really close after the first quarter, but it was the physicality that South Dakota State brought and the violence that they played with really all game. Even if they didn't make a play and if the first guy missed the tackle, uh, they were coming downhill and there, there was no fear from South Dakota State at all. And the way that they ran Mark Gronowski, their quarterback, they came to win that game. We, it stood out immediately. Um, so from a physicality standpoint, Oklahoma State got tested in week one. There's no doubt. They were forced to – they were going forward on third and long. They were going forward on fourth down. Uh, They were having to uh, tackle well and wrap up. They were forced to defend quarterback run game, uh, which this week I know is going to be important as well with Taylor Green. Mm -hmm. Um, All of those things, if you ask me the difference between the two – and I have not done a deep dive in the the Pine Bluff game. Uh, I think mainly because it was like don't, you mentioned. Don't waste I don't your know time. It was ever really in question. <laughs> um, but the difference between the two, I would say, is just on paper from from thirty thousand foot view of the Arkansas game. I would say it's very clear that Oklahoma State was tested more in Week One than Arkansas was. I think that's fair to say. Now that may not mean much. Uh, looked like Arkansas handled business as they were supposed to. You'd obviously prefer that than some of the bigger programs in the country that uh, struggled against FCS teams, certainly in week one. But for Oklahoma State, they were tested in the interior, and I thought they answered the bell well up front, and, and I thought they tackled well. Arkansas is going over to Boone Pickens Stadium for the first time in about 50 years. And so a lot of people who maybe don't pay attention to Oklahoma State don't understand the uniqueness of the stadium and the sidelines, and they've heard Sam Pittman talk about this this weekend. But you've seen this, and you've been on college sidelines. Uh, The Oklahoma, and they've reported in the past that in some areas that it's only 10 feet from the field uh, to the stands, and, you know, there as it gets closer to the end zone. Explain the uniqueness of this and maybe how being in such a a tight space affects the operation of a sideline. Well, Correct me if I'm wrong. I th- this is an early kick, right? It's at 11 o'clock 11 game. I think that will benefit because the we played there at a night game. Um, and regardless of time of day, it's a great atmosphere. But you're exactly right. For anybody that hasn't been to this stadium or ever really paid attention to it, I think it's the tightest sideline in college football. I mean, it is right there. Um, so much so that you know the fans can disrupt your meetings on the sideline. Like when the offensive line, I remember when we played there, the offensive linemen had to sort of pivot there where they were meeting because the fans were shouting in their huddle and you, you mm-hmm. couldn't really hear that well. Um, they have those paddles as well that the, yep. the kids are banging on the, yep. the padded sides. Uh, it's a great atmosphere. It doesn't, you know, I think max capacity is less than 60,000. Mm-hmm. And so it's not a massive stadium, but it's right on top of you. And, uh, they've got that closed in end zone on one side and then the facility on the other noise kind of stays in there. And the first quarter of our game, there was a really good atmosphere and it was, it was loud after that, there wasn't a ton of noise because they didn't they really need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that it'll be a, a big atmosphere this weekend and it's a fun place to go play, but they are right on top of you. 
so you've talked about receivers. We've talked about Alan Bowman. Gordon gets the highlight or the, the headlines uh, for this team. Who else stood out to you? Uh, Ceci Vailahi, the, the backup running back, he was strong as well. Um, and then on the defensive side, I know we talked about Mahalski at center. On the defensive side in the interior, their linebackers, I think both were preseason all-conference uh, for the Big 12. I think they have the best linebackers in the Big 12. And they also, they ask, I mean, it's a 3-3-5 defense, right? So they ask uh, on the defensive side, they'll bring down Colin Oliver, number 30. He's sort of their fourth defender that uh, I think he graded out. I saw some stuff on from PFF. It looked like he had a, a really good week one. Um, but they'll bring him down as that fourth defender. And anytime Arkansas or anybody goes heavy, and it looks like they're you know either at a tight end or they go 12 personnel, you'll see Colin Oliver walk down as that the fourth defensive lineman, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the the linebackers do such a good job of whether it's uh, in run fits, they're always in the right spot. And then they did a good job in coverage as well on the back end. Uh, I think it was Corey Black had the interception. It wasn't a particularly challenging. They tried to throw the comeback to him on the outside. He made a play. He was right there. But I thought overall impressions really sound on defense. They weren't in um, – there weren't a lot of MAs. You didn't have busts, but the linebacking core, I would say everything on the defense, they showed up and, and for all the off season and preseason hype, I thought they lived up to expectations. You're living in an sec town now down in Austin, <laughs> uh, a little bit of a change there. You're not calling Arkansas's games, but uh, you're, you're just overall, maybe 40,000 foot view yeah. of the Razorbacks program. Well, first thing I, I got to see Taylor Green a couple times the last few years because a lot of my work is with CBS and and we've done a lot of Mountain West and uh, that's a really exciting player and I think the uh, former staff at Boise State I thought they were doing him a disservice and I'm excited for him just as a, a player to have this opportunity because I think Arkansas will get more out of him mm. than the former regime at Boise State did. Um, they were not using him appropriately in my opinion uh, tw towards the end of his time there. The other thing, just as a fan of the sport, and, and like you mentioned, I live in Austin, I think it's great that Arkansas and Texas are in the same conference now. And I could tell you, Texas, their schedule kind of goes up and down, right? If you look at uh, the challenges they have, obviously a big one this week against Michigan, um, but they have uh, the test going to Arkansas is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, that's one on the schedule that I don't think gets enough uh, praise to this point, or I don't know if praise is the right word, but that to me is one that uh, that's a tough test. And regardless of where Arkansas is at, at that point in the season, I, I think Texas fans have that memory of a couple years ago, going up to Arkansas and getting their doors blown off. So um, I think it's great for the sport. I think it's great for the rivalry. Joe Tessitore said this summer that uh, Arkansas fans hate Texas more than they love the Razorbacks. Uh, that kind of gives you an idea of that. Hey, one more for you. Uh, I know you're going to Air Force this weekend. You said that that's yeah. going to be the first time uh, you'll be there. A, a really cool stadium. Hope you enjoy that. Yeah. But you called a game last Thursday at the Sporting KC Stadium in Kansas City because KU cannot use its facility this year because of renovations. Yeah. So they're playing some games. Or all of their games, I think, are in Kansas City. Some at the Sporting KC Stadium. I think they'll play a game or two at Arrowhead. Uh, what was it like calling uh, college football inside a pro soccer stadium? <laughs> Yeah, that was different for sure. I thought it was perfect for that that matchup because I don't I don't think you know if you play that one, it, they're playing two at Sporting KC Stadium and then four at Arrowhead. Yeah. If you have that game against Lindenwood at Arrowhead, it's probably not a great crowd, um, and they're playing UNLV there as well. It's perfect for that type of atmosphere. And then later in the year, if if Kansas is still performing well, then you expect bigger crowds for Arrowhead. But uh, it was good to see Jalen Daniels back at quarterback. Uh, they've got a big one this week against Illinois, and I think out of the Big 12, that should be a contender and towards the, the top quarter of that that uh, conference. But Sporting KC, it was interesting to call a game in a soccer stadium. It was a tight venue for sure. Mm -hmm. Taylor, you've been great with your time. We appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll see you down the road this year. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me on. Taylor McCarg. When we come back, Christina Long will be on the desk. We'll talk head-to-head -head comparisons between the Razorbacks and the Cowboys, but first to work from our sponsors. LPGA Week in Northwest Arkansas returns September 23rd through the 29th for the 18th consecutive year. 
Watch former Razorbacks and 2024 Olympians Maria Fossey and Gabby Lopez compete against the world's best female golfers at the Walmart Northwest Arkansas Championship, presented by P&G at Pinnacle Country Club in Rogers. The NWA Championship is so much more than a golf tournament, with something for everyone to enjoy and activities for fans of all ages. Daily tickets are only $10, and kids 17 and under get in free with a ticketed adult. Get your tickets today at nwachampionship.com. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King, we are Soapbox, we are Shopcart, we are design. Welcome back. We appreciate you being here. Christina Long, now the editor of Hogs Illustrated Magazine, is in studio. We want to talk about the new magazine. You can stay on top of all your Razorback sports with a digital subscription to the Hogs Illustrated app. Uh, includes breaking news, commentaries, analysis, features, everything at wholehogsports.com is included in this subscription. Complete access to our website. Monthly subscriptions begin at $17. You can join now at hogsillustrated.com slash subscribe, or you can call 479 684 5509. Christina's got the new copy right here. Yeah, we're super excited. This is, um, we've got Fernando Carmona on our, um, our most recent cover. This is a story I got to work on, got to speak with Fernando and his family. He has a really interesting story about how he actually wanted to play basketball. Um, that was his sport. And he didn't actually start playing football until his junior year of high school. And his family was involved in that. He had coaches in the family. And then when he started, he was a tight end did not want to play offensive line, was actively resistant to playing offensive line. And hmm. then kind of that sort of process changed. I got to talk to him about all of that and, and just the impact his family had on him. So excited about that in this issue. We've got soccer, basketball, some baseball in this issue. There's This one covers a lot, so we're excited about this one. For people who haven't seen the magazine in a while or ever, and I've worked here for 17 years or 17 football seasons with this magazine, it looks different now than we've done it in the past. Just explain that. Yeah, I mean, one thing we're doing a lot of is we have made this, we're adding a lot more sports coverage into this. So in terms of other than football, we've got a lot of other things. And then the way that we are covering, that we're weekly during the football season, and the way that we're covering these games is a little bit different. So we've got um, a, sort of, rather than doing like a traditional kind of game recap and putting a bunch of stats in there and, and kind of telling you what maybe the newspaper or the website would tell you about the game, we actually have, you know, basically takeaways from the game, what we learned about Arkansas from the most recent game. So we have that on the UAPB game in this issue. And then when we look ahead to the upcoming game, we are actually doing a sort of head-to-head -head look, which is something we're going to talk about today, um, with what Arkansas and the future opponents, so in this case Arkansas and Oklahoma State, who has the advantage at every single position group from our view and kind of why we feel that way, what they've shown us this season to indicate that. So that's a way that we've changed a little bit the way that we cover these games and then our cover stories are a little bit different. We are featuring not necessarily a player every time. We've done that a lot and we'll continue to do that, but we'll feature, you know, a really interesting, compelling story will be our cover story every week as opposed to just, you know, a game recap, something like that. So it has changed a lot. I'm I'm happy with the changes that we've made. I think we'll continue to adjust stuff and I think it looks really beautiful too. Hold that up again. That's a great picture of Fernando Carmona. That's yeah. That's this is awesome. from UAPB. Yeah, he had he was like strutting. He had, he struck some great poses um, in this in this game. So I I was excited when we got the photos back. Hank Layton's our photographer. Great job uh, by him. Let's talk about this this head to head comparison between Arkansas and Oklahoma State. Uh, it's on our website this morning at wholehogsports.com. Um, we won't go through everything, but but let's hit on some things. We quarterback is interesting to me because I just feel like there's so many. I think there's a lot of comparisons you can make between Taylor Green and Alan Bowman. Green didn't have the greatest year last year at Boise. Bowman didn't have the latest or the greatest year last year at Oklahoma State. And maybe it feels weird to say that because they both led their teams to conference championship games. Boise won the conference. Oklahoma State was the runner up to Texas. But I think both of them would tell you that, you know, if you just kind of analyze their individual play, it's just kind of a so so year. So it's interesting to me about, like, who do you evaluate who has the upper hand at quarterback? I think really what it comes down to me, though, Christina, is that you got Bowman in the third year in his system. Green is in the second game in his system. 
And so there's more experience there for Bowman. Obviously, he's getting to play at home too, which I think is you know rather beneficial. I think Taylor Green may be a better quarterback. Going into the game, though, it, it's hard not to give the upper hand to Bowman. Right. That was kind of what I felt. I, I handed the, When I wrote this, I handed the advantage to Oklahoma State because I did feel like there was the experience factor. I agree with you that Taylor Green might be a better quarterback. I haven't seen it yet. And I think a lot of they, they have a lot of similar issues. They both had interception problems, accuracy problems last season. And we need to see from each of them if they have solved that problem. We don't know if Alan Bowman has. He feels like he has. Taylor Green also feels like he has. Both of them had good showings in week one against FCS teams. We've talked before on this podcast about how Oklahoma State faced a better FCS team than Arkansas did. That's why this game is so important and how why we're going to learn so much. So I did give the edge to Alan Bowman just from that experience factor. I think experience can be a boon. It doesn't necessarily make you great. Um, so I, I did give him the edge in that regard because I feel like we've seen it from him a little bit more. You know, he has had more success on this level with in, in this system with this team, whereas Taylor Green feels a little bit more of a question mark to me. Running back is an interesting one to me because obviously Oklahoma State has the best running back from last year who returned to college football, and he won the Doak uh, Walker last year too. Probably could have given it to, to Schrader at Missouri. That I don't know what anybody would have batted an eye about that, but, but he's gone. Gordon's back at Oklahoma State. What's interesting to me, though, is that I think Arkansas might have a deeper running back group than Oklahoma State does because they run Gordon so much that you don't really know a whole lot about who they have behind him. And he he ran the ball 27 times against South Dakota State the other day. Arkansas, I like Jackson. And I think the coaches really like the other three that they're you know rotating in behind him. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I, I gave this one to Oklahoma State, too, because of the Ollie Gordon factor. If anything were to happen to Ollie Gordon, it's a totally different story, right? Mm -hmm. Because I totally agree with you about the depth. Um, I, I don't think we know what they have behind him, and I don't think we're supposed to, you know? Like, it is Ollie Gordon's show, you know? So I just think I, I did give it to him because, like, he's playing in this game. He's not hurt. You know, he's healthy, whatever. He's playing this game. So I, I do think they have the advantage there. But in terms of the overall running back room and, you know, when we look at Arkansas in its other games, running back is one of its biggest strengths. Like you said, they have great depth there. They have multiple guys they feel good about. Um, they feel great about Rodney Hill, who I'll be interested to see what he does going forward. I know we talked about him as a kind of surprising newcomer the other day. So I just think... I, I did give it to Oklahoma State because Ollie Gordon trumps almost any running back in college football, but that's not to say Arkansas doesn't have great running backs and won't have success running the ball in this game. Is A.J. Green, he's out for... He's Yeah, he got right? injured, yeah, so he won't be playing in this one. Yeah, the former Arkansas running back. Special teams I thought was kind of interesting. You gave Arkansas the upper hand. I did. I they. It's funny, they kind of had similar questions on special teams at least with regard to kicker um as oklahoma state so they had a guy that they just weren't really sure about he made some extra points last season and he did kickoffs but he hadn't really kicked field goals mm -hmm. um his name's logan ward mm -hmm. and arkansas you know loses cam little gets these two transfers and there's some shuffling that happens throughout the preseason and we're not really sure who's going to run out there and then oh it's kyle ramsey he doesn't attempt a field goal because they don't have to take any field goals against uapb so both of them are kind of question marks. Now, Logan Ward went three for three in his first game. Um, he made he had makes from 25, 42, and 52. So looked really good in the opener. So he might have it. Um, so I did give it to Arkansas because I think we're unsure still about consistency with Ward. Obviously, he's got it. He made a 52-yarder, but will he do it every time? Will he do it consistently? We also don't totally know that about Arkansas's kickers. Um, but I think given the success that they've had at their previous schools, we know that they did it then. They should be able to do it here. I'm going to tell you about the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club. Uh, Kevin Trainer was there with us yesterday. Great great time listening to Kevin. Uh, if you want to uh, hear the interview that I had with him, the Q&A session, you can go find that right now on our YouTube page. Just search Whole Hog Sports. Uh, coming up next Wednesday, we've got Brandon Marcello of 24-7 Sports. Brandon was here on the desk with us a few weeks ago. Uh, he actually had this job at one point in time before uh, he, he went on to Mississippi State and then Auburn, and now he's with 24-7 Sports. It'll be fun to catch up with Brandon there. On September 18th, Jordan Weber, the Arkansas Gymnastics coach, will be there. And on September 25th, Hunter Juracek. Uh, those are just in the month of September. We've got more luncheons 
uh, scheduled as we go on throughout the rest of the fall. You can find that full list. You can reserve your seat now for any of those luncheons at ozarkstix.com, O-Z-A-R-K-S-T-I-X.com. Christina, as we continue to look at uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma State here, a lot of people feel like this game's going to come down to how well does Arkansas's defensive line match up against Oklahoma State's offensive line. I know you gave Arkansas's D-line the advantage. You've given Oklahoma State's O-line the advantage. What do you see there uh, in, in terms of just matchup? Yeah, I'm excited to watch it. It's it's tough. I think o- Arkansas has a better defensive line than Oklahoma State has a defensive line. Um, I think Oklahoma State has a better offensive line than Arkansas does. I also think we don't kn- we haven't seen enough from Arkansas's new offensive line to know how high their ceiling is. They obviously did well against UAPB. It was UAPB. This will be a huge game for them. As far as Arkansas versus Oklahoma State in the trenches, I I am intrigued. I think this will teach us a lot, especially about the tackle spot mm. um, and how you know Campbell, Eric Gregory, obviously very veteran. They feel good about them. Um, but what they're able to do against an offensive line like this will be something to watch all game. And if they have to bring in, you know, some of these other tackles, they feel good about, um, some of them, but there's some concern about some of the depth. Mm. Um, I think defensive end wise, obviously you have Landon Jackson. I wrote in here that he'll be the most talented defensive lineman on the field for either team. Um, what he's able to do, how they protect against him we'll see. Um, and then I think with Nico Davier and Anton Junkaj rotating at that other spot, those guys both are need to be put to the test in this way. I think. Did you have a head to head for coach personality? <laughs> I did not, but that would be a hard it one. would have been a good one. That would be a hard one for sure. Yeah. I, I was listening to Mike Gundy on uh, uh, Chuck Barrett and Bo Mattingly show yesterday. And he mentioned something that I knew a while back, but I had forgotten about that, that his son had actually gone to the yeah. university of Arkansas. So He's got a little bit of a connection. Obviously, Sam's got the connections to Oklahoma uh, growing up over in Grove. And then uh, I also <laughs> had thought about this. Remember when Gundy had the mullet? Do, yeah. Do you remember oh, what yeah. he called it? No. The Arkansas Waterfall. That's hilarious. I didn't know that. That's, That's what he so called it. That's so funny. Yeah. So. Wow. I, yeah, I don't know. Too... Who, would, who would you give the heads? The I advantage? don't know. I guess maybe I find Pittman more likable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's maybe I, not as abrasive. Yes, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I think uh I feel like they would hang out. I think though. they're both a lot of fun yeah. in, in 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 their own way. Totally. Like like just And I think they'd get along really well. Yeah. They're likable. Yeah. I feel like Gundy, since Mike Leach died, I think Gundy has maybe taken the he, he's taken over that spot as like the biggest character the in college football. Kinda, yeah. I would say it's either him or Lane Kiffin. That's a good pick. Kiffin is a different flavor of oddball. Yeah. Kiffin is like an Very a-hole. Dry. Yes. And like you kind of love to hate him. Whereas <laughs> Mike Leach, you were just like, oh, what's he going to say? Like get yeah. him going on any topic. And I feel like Gundy's more like that. Kiffin, you're like, what's he going to say? Like who's he going to make mad? You know? <laughs> so it's a little bit of a different flavor. Hey, I want to mention a few things here real quick on other sports uh, before we move on and talk to Marshall Scott from Pistols Firing Blog. Uh, Anthony Christensen reported yesterday that the Arkansas Pacific basketball game has been set for November 18th. So we're almost there on the Arkansas basketball schedule. We got one more game uh, to figure out. That's going to be at Bud Walton Arena. Uh, you can go to our website and read Anthony's story. He's got the, the full list of games that we know about right now. Also, it was announced yesterday that Arkansas's games at Globe Life Field uh, in Arlington have been set for February. These are baseball games. The Razorbacks, kind of an interesting slate of games. They are going to play Kansas State on a Friday night. Obviously, K-State came to bomb and beat Arkansas and put them in the loser's bracket last year. That's a Friday night game on February 21st. The next night, they will play TCU. TCU came to Fayetteville two years ago and knocked Arkansas out in its home regional. Uh, so the, the the Purple Powers from the Big 12, they play those two teams, and then they'll play Michigan on Sunday. They played Michigan uh, down there last year. That event is a lot of fun. If you've never been... The Saturday night game between Arkansas and TCU in 2023, the announced attendance there was right at around 20,000, maybe 21,000. Just to give you an idea, the College World Series has 25,000 people at a game. And so this is a regular season game where you've got 21,000 people in the seats, and it seems like Arkansas's games there just continue to grow every year. It's like as people continue to go down there and come back and tell their friends, hey, you got to come down to this, it's like a baseball bowl game in February. Yeah. And it just seems like it grows and grows and grows, and I've been there for a lot of them, and uh, it's a really, really fun environment. 
Yeah, it's so cool that they do those early season games that are so such big matchups. I mean, we were talking the other day about playing FCS teams like UAPB in football. And obviously mm-hmm. football is a different sport. The scheduling's totally different and you can't, you know, do the same thing. But it's it's so cool with baseball and even basketball, you know, scheduling exhibitions against the likes of Kansas and, and TCU, you mm-hmm. know, getting some of these early excitement. Obviously it's different with exhibition, but Getting that early excitement, getting those early tests is so much fun for fans and probably for the teams, too. We don't have dates yet for those two basketball exhibitions. Uh, I have seen it reported that TCU is on November 1st, but I don't think that's been officially announced. And and, and obviously Arkansas and KU are are in discussions to uh, play a game at Bud Walton this year. I want to mention a couple of other sports real quick. On Saturday night in Fayetteville, BYU comes to town to play the Arkansas soccer team, Arkansas number 6 in this week's United Soccer Coaches Poll. Uh, BYU is a team that makes it to the College Cup quite a bit, and I think they might have even been national runner-up last year or or the year before. So this is a really big game over at Razorback Field. And then the uh, Razorback Volleyball team, who is also ranked in the top 25, uh, they will kick off uh, their home portion of their schedule this weekend. They play Rutgers on Thursday night. They play uh, they play Southern Miss on Friday. They play a couple of more games this weekend. They've got a game every day between Thursday through Sunday over at Barnhill Arena. And you can read about all these sports at wholehogsports.com. We have different reporters uh, who are on top of all of them. Christina, we appreciate you being here. We'll see you over in Stillwater. And when we come back, we're going to have Marshall Scott with us. He is the publisher of the Pistols Firing blog. We'll talk to him about the Cowboys. But first, a word from our sponsors. Taste, sip, sample, and discover the very best restaurants and chefs Northwest Arkansas has to offer at the Bite Experience at the LPGA, a unique culinary experience on site at the Northwest Arkansas Championship. Tickets are available Friday, September 27th through Sunday, September 29th, offering access to the best golf viewing and food and beverage samples from over 30 local restaurants. You don't want to miss this. Tickets are available for $45 a day. Get yours before they sell out at BiteNWA.com. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are design. And welcome back. I want to tell you about our friends at Bentonville Glass, serving its community since 1971. Bentonville Glass is committed, professional, and versatile. If you're looking for a quality leader in northwest Arkansas or looking for skilled craftsmanship, choose Bentonville Glass for all your glass market needs with the highest quality products. You can come by and see them at 507 South Main in Bentonville or online at bentonvilleglass.com. Marshall Scott is the publisher of Pistols Firing Blog. This is uh, I love finding these uh, different... Uh, uh, websites. I mean, we're wholehogsports.com. You've got Texags down in College Station. Finding these sites that have just great names that, that really fit the, the programs they're covering. And if you don't know the, the history of pistols firing, Dave Hunziker, who's the uh, play-by-play voice of Oklahoma State, every time he has a touchdown call, he, he precedes it with pistols firing because uh, they've got uh, you know people with, with guns down on the field and they shoot them off. And so, Marshall, number one, uh, congratulations to you guys on a great uh, blog name. Uh, but you do a great job. I, I I have got an interest in Oklahoma State. I go uh, look at your stuff from time to time, and we appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you for the kind words, and uh, I'm excited to be here. So this is the first time that an SEC team has come to Stillwater in 15 years. Georgia was the last in 2009. I wonder what the vibe is like over there. Uh, Is it different with an SEC team coming to town maybe than other big non-conference games? It's tough to say. I think I'd get a better gauge on that maybe in in previous years. Uh, The fan base is just so excited for this team in particular um, that I'm not really sure it mattered who's coming in. Uh, Obviously, it's a big deal that an SEC team is coming in. uh, But I think right now this fan base is excited about, you know, Ollie Gordon, um, this experienced offensive line. Uh, you, you know, some some key playmakers back on the defense like Nick Martin and Colin Oliver. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, yeah, there will probably be a little bit more juice. Uh, I, I bet this fan base is hoping that this was a night game um, to, to kind of provide a little bit more. Um, but I think for the most part, this this fan base in its entirety um, is more so just excited for what it's got. Um, you know, all the season tickets or all of the, the games had sold out before the season even started. That's the first time in a, a long while, if ever, uh, that that's happened. Um, so, yeah, I think this fan base is juiced no matter who's coming. But I, I think with Arkansas uh, making the short trip over, I, I think it's uh, going to be a fun environment on Saturday. 
What was your take on 44 to 20 over South Dakota State? Yeah, I think it was more impressive than uh, maybe maybe some people were expecting just because of what happened to Oklahoma State in the non-con last year, obviously losing to South Alabama um, and not looking that great in their other two games either. Um, so, so this was, I think, a good step forward for this group to say, hey, you know, we're, we're not last year's team that, that struggled early on and then found its footing. We can kind of hit the ground running a little bit. So um, I, I think that was impressive. Obviously, you know, gave up some some big plays uh, to South Dakota State. That was kind of the one glaring issue. Um, they gave up 204 yards in, in six plays um, of the 388 total yards that they gave up. So if they're able to cut down that, it, it certainly looks a lot better. Uh, but I think just with how last season's non-conference slate uh, went, obviously losing 33-7 to, uh, to South Alabama, I, I think Oklahoma State fans were, were more than happy with, with Saturday's result. And we were talking about this with Taylor McCarg earlier who called the game over there last week. The, the comments that Gundy made afterwards said that, you know, he's got high expectations, lofty expectations, and that the team had fallen short of those. How much do you think the chunk plays that you were talking about played into those comments? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think a ton just because that's a, kind of an issue that, that hurt Oklahoma State last year. Thinking back particularly to the UCF game, a game they got blown out in uh, in a monsoon down in Orlando. Um, and, and then another aspect that, that Gunny wasn't too thrilled about was the run blocking. I, I mentioned how experienced that offensive line was. There, there's five, six year uh, guys all started last season. Um, and, and obviously with the reigning Doak Walker winner and Ollie Gordon, um, maybe expected a bit of a better performance than 3.8 yards uh, on the ground. Uh, by carry on the ground with all that um so, so yeah talking with some offensive linemen or one offensive lineman dalton cooper this week um said that they're working uh, diligently on kind of getting to the second level and creating bigger lanes for ollie uh going into this week so yeah i i think some of those comments were definitely on the defense giving up those big plays um kind of like last season um and, and then a little bit more um just on how oklahoma state didn't necessarily dominate uh the line of scrimmage as maybe they wanted to it feels to me like the quarterback matchup this week the there's some similarities in the two. Taylor Green was at Boise last year, had some struggles with the completion percentage, had some struggles with interceptions. Bowman, I think it was kind of the same thing at Oklahoma State. The difference is Green's in a new system this year. Bowman is, you know, obviously still there in Stillwater. How do the coaches feel about maybe the steps that he's taken since last year uh, to him improve his game? How confident are they that he can cut down on some of those issues that were issues a year ago? Yeah, I think both coaches and the fan base kind of or the fan base in particular. Um, I think the coaches were always all, all the way in on, on Alan Bowman this season. Uh, the fan base kind of had to see it to believe it. And you mentioned the interceptions. I think he had a, a 15 to 14 touchdown to interception ratio, um, had a, a completion percentage in the low 60s, I think it was. But but Saturday's performance, I think, really eased uh, a lot of the minds of Cowboys fans. Um, you know, 245, not a gaudy uh, passing total, but, but, you know, had one, I think turnover worthy play and he knew it, uh, right after the, the game, he, he'd mentioned, uh, that he's just got to throw that ball into the stands, uh, in the second half. Uh, but you know, had a, had his highest completion percentage as a cowboy, um, looked in control the whole time. Um, you know, I think what's really helped Alan Bowman is, is not only having another year in the system, but, but this time last year, he was in a three quarterback rotation, um, in his first year in the system. So, so that just couldn't have been good for, um, you know, finding growth opportunities there. Um, but, but I think with, with the whole year of experience within the system and then having this whole off season to, to kind of know that he's the guy, um, I, I think that's helped him out a lot. Obviously you don't want to overreact based on one game against, you know, an FCS team. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that, that certainly looked like a more comfortable Allen Bowman than, than what we saw last year. Marquise Robinson, an Arkansas defensive back was one of the ones who got Bowman last year during the South Alabama game, uh, 33 to seven. Oklahoma State kind of turned it on after that game. I know they they still had a little bit of a, a rough spell, but they you know began to turn their season around late September, early October. How much do you think the embarrassment of that game maybe helps them? Does it help them prepare differently at all? I mean, do you think that you know the the fact that they had an early season letdown at home last year has any bearing on this week? Yeah, I think in a way it helped them find out who they were last year. Um, you know, they, they, like I mentioned, they were rotating three quarterbacks and pretty much nobody thought that that was a good idea. Um, and then, uh, I think Ollie Gordon had maybe 17 total carries in the non-conference games. Um, so then going into the big 12 play, they, they go up to Iowa state to start, um, their big 12 schedule. Um, and they got Alan Bowman starting at quarterback. He plays the whole game and they're handing the ball to Ollie Gordon and they lost that game. Uh, but that kind of showed you what this team could be that, that if that happened, you know, in, in game one, instead of game four, you kind of wonder what Oklahoma state season looked like. So I, I think that's kind of where they, they turned their season around. They found out, Hey, 
Um, you know, we, we've got this stud in the, in the backfield in, in Ollie Gordon, and we just kind of need to settle on one quarterback because whenever they're rotating those three guys in, it, it you could just plainly see that nobody could get in a rhythm. Um, so, yeah, I, and, and then going into to last week in particular, I think the the disappointments of, of last season in the non-con um, really made sure that these guys were, were kind of in, in sync from day one. So, yeah, I, I think they're they're no longer going to take any non-conference opponent, you know, from the SCS level or from, you know, the SEC uh, lightly just because of what happened last season. What's the perception of Arkansas over there? Are, are there ways you think the, the Razorbacks can challenge them on Saturday? Yeah, I, I think the the big matchup that I'm kind of looking forward to is that, that that stout defensive line versus, like I mentioned, all the experience that Oklahoma State's got up front. Um, you know, th- this offensive line has been together for the most part for a long time now. Um, they- they've had their peaks, they've had their valleys. You-, you know, anytime you're starting as young as some of these guys started uh, on the offensive line, that's a grown man's area down there. Um, it's not always going to look great. Um, so-, so this group has kind of had to battle through um, a perception of them throughout various seasons. Uh, but th- what an opportunity for them. You know, you've got Landon Jackson, a projected first round pick um, and those those big guys on the inside. So, so I think that that the offensive line in particular is seeing this as an opportunity to kind of show themselves um, as a as a good unit, um, as a, a unit that could lead lead this team to the Big 12 title um, to, to and that would in turn lead them to the college football playoffs. So that, that's kind of uh, where I'm looking forward to as far as, you know, grand perceptions of Arkansas. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the 70 to nothing win certainly raised some eyebrows um, or, around Stillwater. You know, you wonder about the competition. I think, you know, even Sam Pittman on Monday was like, hey, if we're not going to play another team that's that's like that this season. Uh, so but I think that that de- definitely uh, raised a couple eyebrows, put put um, Arkansas on the radar if they weren't already. Um, and yeah, the, the, the matchup I'm most looking forward to is that offensive line versus that defensive line. When Arkansas was over in Stillwater a couple of years ago, I was, I was driving around campus there and. I just kept having this thought that I don't know that there are many schools that can benefit more from Texas and OU going to the SEC than Oklahoma State can because Oklahoma State's been there. I mean, they've been in the championship game two of the last three seasons. Uh, they're they're a competitive team in that conference, and now you take two of the big dogs out, and it feels like Oklahoma State has a chance in this expanded playoff and in the new look Big Twelve uh, to to really continue to change the perception of the program i mean it's come a long way in the last 25 years it feels like they could take a step up the ladder if if they maybe hit some good fortunes over the next few years yeah that's that's been a talk pretty much since it since it was announced that that ou and texas were leaving it was hey who's going to be the the flag bearer for this big 12 conference does it does the conference need a flag bearer and, and obviously if you look to all the success that oklahoma state has had over uh, under mike gundy over the years um you, you know oklahoma state certainly in that mix uh, initially it was thought in the 2021 season that, that it would be Oklahoma State and Baylor because they were the two teams that, that went to the, the Big 12 title game. Obviously, Baylor's um, had some rough stretches since since then. Um, and then you add Utah to the league and, and Utah fans, um, based on their success in the Pac-12, thinks, hey, Utah's here to run this conference. So um, I, I think that's kind of what's fun about it. it it's sort of one of the last... Um, I don't really know how to put this, but the, the last true college football conference, you know, the SEC is, is getting glitz and glamour. And, and that's, I think, great for the sport, um, just based on all the eyeballs that are watching. Same with the Big Ten. Um, but, you know, the Big 12, with, with it, it's it's been labeled the truck stop conference, which hmm. um, some Big 12 fans honestly like. Uh, they, they like that, um, you know, this is just, you know, good old fashioned college football. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, that if, if any team is set to take a next step into uh, a role of kind of overlooking a conference like a Georgia, like an Alabama in the SEC, or, or like an Ohio State, like a Michigan in the Big Ten. Um, I, I think Oklahoma State's got to be up there uh, in terms of kind of running the Big 12 moving forward. What's it going to take to get Bedlam back? Uh, yeah, it, it's going to take time, I, I think, is the main thing. Both both uh, schools have have their non-conference games scheduled so far out in advance. Um, just over the next couple of years, obviously, Oklahoma State's got a couple of games with Arkansas. They've got a uh, home-and-home with Oregon. They've got a home-and-home with Alabama. Um, so, so everybody's kind of scheduled out a little bit. I, I think it was like 2032 was like the first possible opportunity. Um, and, and then I, I think that there are probably still some, some hurt feelings with, with OSU kind of leaving in the dead of the night um, in Oklahoma State saying, hey, we're going to stand on our own two feet then. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's just going to take time. I, I do think it will happen again at some point. Um, but, but just with how scheduled out these non-conference games are, I, I do think it's going to be a little bit. College football needs that game. Um, I agree. I agree. It, it's such a, a fun rivalry. I think it's it's one of the great ones. And you know, and we see what SEC teams like Florida. They play Florida State, Clemson, and South Carolina, and you go on and on. 
uh, teams make it work. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, OU and, and Oklahoma State can do that as well. For people who have not been to Stillwater on a football game day, explain it to them. Yeah, it's the, the tailgate scene is, is really good here. It's really grown under Mike Gundy. Um, there's going to be tailgates all throughout campus. Um, there tomorrow, I think, is is when people can can claim their their plots of land. Uh, so that's going to happen all day tomorrow. Um, you know, 11 a.m. cake going to be a little bit weird. It's going to be more breakfast, I guess, than, than traditional barbecue and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, you know, you're right there. If you haven't been to, to Stillwater, obviously Eskimo Joe's gets all the headlines. Really good cheese fries. I, I recommend the sweet pepper bacon ones. Um, you know, not too far from, from the stadium. Hideaway Pizza down the street a little bit as well. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a good time. It's, it's tailgates everywhere. Pretty much. I'm, I'm sure that, that you guys get a ton of that in the sec. Uh, so yeah, the, it, it's a, it's a fun environment there. Obviously it's still water. There's not, you know, a ton, a ton to do. Um, but, but this, this community really rallies around this football program and, and game days are almost like a holiday every week. I heard Eskimo Joe's is opening for uh, breakfast. Do they serve sweet pepper bacon cheese fries for breakfast there? I'd imagine that they serve. It'd be a poor business if they didn't serve them at all times of the day. So I'd imagine. I'd imagine if you walked in and asked for some at any time that they're open, uh, they'll be happy to oblige. How many restaurants in Stillwater end with Joe's? Um, so right now I think it's just two. Okay. Um, so it's yeah, the Mexico Joe's and Eskimo Joe's. There used to be. Uh, well, there's a smoking a Joe's too, right? Though, or smoky there's Joe's, a, what? a smoky Joe's or barbecue. Oh yeah, smoky Joe's barbecue. Yep. I don't know that it's the same people. I, I guess I should know know that probably. I don't know that it's under the same umbrella. But, okay. but there used to be a, a place called Giuseppe's, which was a Italian Mexico Joe's, and then there was a place called Mojo's, which had like a, a bowling alley in it. So uh, yeah, a lot of Joe's going on for sure. <laughs> Marshall, we appreciate your time. Uh, Marshall Scott of the Pistols Firing Blog, and we uh, look forward to seeing you Saturday over in Stillwater. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. All right. We appreciate you being here on our podcast today. We'll be back with one more podcast before the Razorbacks play the Cowboys. Until then, hope you'll go to our website, wholehogsports.com. We'll see you next time.